And this is your election headquarters and the governing new patriotic party is just about making a critical decision that will decide whether or not they are able to break the eight. This indeed is the party's national delegates conference and this is your election eve special. My name is Evans Mens and I'm here with Winston Amoa. And we'll be crossing over pretty shortly to where all this is going to play out tomorrow morning. That is the Accra Sports Stadium, where my colleague, uh, member of the political deck, Samuel Mbura, is standing by. But why are we doing this tonight? It is obvious. The MPP, the governing party, the party of the, uh, who, which has the, of course, the, the governance of this country, uh, in its purview, is making a decision. That decision will decide whether or not, as they have articulated, they can break the eight, as in win and in another elections. But also consider the context within which this elections and the conference is happening makes this a very critical election that could make or break the MPP. We are at a time when we are having a conversation with the International Monetary Fund, possibly for a bailout. It is an admission the things have gone pretty terribly bad with the economy. But guess who has been in charge of the economy for the last, what, six years? It's been the NPP. And it's, of course, candidates that stood in the last elections and won, and of course in 2016 and won as well. But that party, that party that gave birth to this government is, is at the heart of governing this country. And that is why sometimes you see the general secretary sitting in cabinet. That general secretary is tomorrow up for re-election. So you begin to appreciate why the election of the MPP, the national elections of the MPP is important. And on this show tonight, on election eve, we're going to be going through for you the various candidates, but also helping you appreciate what the outcomes could mean for you and for this economy and for the governance of this country uh, wasted. Exactly, Evans. And you know, the NPP has talked about wanting to break the eight, unprecedented in our political history under the Fourth Republic. Would that happen? And you've asked a very important question. The General Secretary of the NPP, John Buedu, tomorrow would have the party put a verdict on his leadership as the party's chief administrator. Would the party be satisfied or is the party satisfied with its performance over the last four mm -hmm. years? Mm -hmm. Tomorrow would indicate whether or not the party is satisfied. But can the party also learn from previous elections and decide who becomes the party's general secretary? We'll be showing that right here. But also, as the party talks about breaking the eight, is the party satisfied with its performance in the 2020 general elections? In the eyes of the members of the party or the delegates who will be voting tomorrow, do they think that the party performed up to their expectation in the 2020 general elections? Fortunately, you do not have the incumbent chairman contesting. And so for those who are contesting, you could say that may be an advantage or a disadvantage because if the delegates are unhappy with the party's performance, what they would want to do is to want to change them on block. But there's another thing also that we must consider in all of this. I've just been speaking to one person who lost the 2018 chairmanship race, uh, Dr. Richard Amwakumba, who has a view. He says, this is not an election, but this is an auction. He says, whatever would happen tomorrow, the one with enough money can, would win the election. Is this the kind of image? the NPP would want to create? Mm. Or is this the kind of image the NPP would want associated with the party? The party has indicated it would not tolerate vote buying. Once the party says it would not tolerate vote buying, what would be the outcome? Would it be an election or would it be an auction? And would Stephen in team be a fifth time lucky? Are people say you go three times? He's tried three times unsuccessful. He's tried a fourth time unsuccessful. He's trying for the fifth time. He says, time as soon. Same mantra in 2018. This time around, he believes it could just be his stand. As we have seen in previous elections, and when we get into it, some way, somehow along the line, a candidate emerges. You probably may think he cannot spring a surprise. Then he pulls a surprise, and Stephen in team, once again, becomes the one to give the concession speech. Would the story be the same?
Mm. Listen, our magic and smart war here is going to be helping us uh, do the analysis for you. We're going to be looking at the NPP, but also we cannot end by talking about where the NPP has led this country to now. I'm talking about the IMF decision and what the IMF decision, the implications for the MPP. That is towards the end. Because I know many of you have been asking since the end, and some have even suggested that the MPP should not even be holding a conference in the time of crisis. Um, we've had the reaction from the national chairman, who of course will no longer be there after tomorrow, who say it, it is impunity. But some have asked, and rightly so, that why should I care about an NPP national elections when they run this country to the point where we have to go to the IMF? Well, you, you, you probably should care. And you must care because this is the government in power. And the party that brought the government is going to the polls. What happens to that party today affects you. Because whoever becomes chairman of the party or becomes general secretary of the party also, unfortunately, or fortunately, in this case, plays a role in our governance system. It does. It sits in cabinet. It does. And takes to cabinet the views of the party. Absolutely. You have heard, for instance, uh, Dan Butry make the point that it is the general secretary who does propaganda because the general secretary mm -hmm. is the one trying to bring the party into yeah. office. So whoever becomes the general secretary of the NPP today would be in cabinet. Whoever becomes chairman would sit in cabinet. What views are they going to take to cabinet? Unless you want to suggest to us that, look, Whatever happens in cabinet, the other members of cabinet do not have a view. I do not think so. Yeah. So whatever happens today, and if the NPP is electing its national officers, how they go about the election will send a signal to you how they intend to run the next election. Yeah. Has monocracy come to stay? Will the NPP depart from what happened in 2018? If they do, it means that we're looking forward to an election which may not be so much dependent on... Mm. I mean, your financial resources. But as has been said already, that may not be the case. And that's where the issue about the timing for the conference comes in. Because we, I mean, but for the acceptance or the agreement reached yesterday, as of Wednesday, the conversation was, why would the governing NPP go to the polls? At the time of crisis where I mean, the workers are on strike, there's the food shortage, exactly. we have an economic crisis, there's four prices are going up, etc. And, and, and knowing our elections and knowing how things are done in, in the Ghanaian elections. And I, I, I'll be honest with you, I was in Tamale in 2014. I, I know from 100 cities, 50 cities in those days, and the monies that we're giving out in Kofuridia, 1,000, 1,500. We know what, everything that happened in those elections. And so if Labour was agitating and said, we need a cost of living allowance, and you said you had no money, and then you go out there and show a lot of money. And it's the reason why yesterday, yesterday, for instance, I knew there were a lot of calls uh, to some, uh, you know, uh, campaigns within the NPP. In fact, the National Security Minister was in that meeting because there's been lots of conversations with the National Security Minister, for instance, where people were telling the National Security Minister that make sure the elections do not come off, do not come off. And I knew... That's tomorrow's election. I mean, as in tomorrow's election. And I knew that uh, there was going to be an agreement because the National Security Minister was very confident and he... He had told some of the people who had called him that, look, we can't do anything about it at this point in time. We're too close to the elections to call off the election. And so we'll go ahead with the election. We're going to meet Labour. We expect to reach an agreement with mm -hmm. them. And if you're Labour, you may say, bingo, there's good news. Because now, last night, you agreed on a 15% cost of yeah. living allowance, effective 1st July. Also because the NPP was just bent on having its election. Well, so th th that puts it in perspective for you why we are paying attention to the MPP's National Delegates Conference uh, tomorrow, which it's starting right now, by the way, because the delegates have begun to arrive at the venue already. That is the, uh, the, the, uh, the Accra Sports Stadium, where my colleague Samuel Mbura is with us right now. Uh, hello, Samuel. And I can see uh, from what I'm seeing on the television right now that the stage is almost set. Am I reading this right, Samuel? Exactly, Evans. Right behind me is a podium. That's where the entire action will be taking place tomorrow. So they are still setting up the, the stage. Uh, to my extreme left, you see a, a wood carving of a, an elephant, which is actually an emblem of the 
NPP. Now, um, right uh, on my extreme right, the stands are also there for the various regions to uh, come and occupy for the delegates tomorrow. So uh, we have the Greater Accra region occupying the stands on my extreme right over there, followed by the Ashanti region. Um, the third stance is actually Eastern region. And the next one is for the various branches. They will occupy that particular stance. The um, other stance that follows is the Ahafo region. Ahafo region followed by Bono region, Bono East region. So that's how the arrangement is going to be like. Uh, Northeast region uh, will be under the uh, VIP. We also have the Northern region, which is also directly under the VVIP. So you look at the top there, that is where the uh, VVIP, the president and all the top party members are expected uh, to sit uh, tomorrow. We also have the National Council of, of Elders, patrons and founding members. That is where they are supposed to sit. Then after that, we have the Upper East region also occupying the next stance. Savannah region follows. We have the Upper West region, Central region. OT region, uh, as well as the Western North region, Western region, and the last stance to my extreme, uh, extreme right is the Volta region. We know very well that the capacity here at the uh, Accra Sports Stadium is about 40,000, but just 6,000, a little over 6,000 delegates are expected to come and cast uh, their votes tomorrow. So uh, we um, have party supporters also thronging the, um, the sports stadium here in Accra. If you look at all the streets coming to the sports stadium, it's actually being hoisted with the party flags of the NPP, uh, getting to the external parameters of the, um, the uh, stadium here. We have them also uh, around. The party paraphernalia are out there for sale and then everything is, is set. I must say Evans. Uh, and so of course from everything that I, I, I'm just seeing on the television right now, it really looks like the stage is set. And I wonder if you've managed to grab any of the party executives or let's say the delegates uh, ahead of the big day tomorrow and, and what the mood and expectations are among them. Yeah, Evans, we know the, the critical role that last minutes play. So at the moment, we don't have delegates of, uh, who are casting their ballots tomorrow here at the main venue. My understanding is that um, those who are coming from Upper East Region, Upper West North East Region, um, Northern Region, uh, they are camped at UPSA. Those also coming from Ashanti Region, Bono Region, Bono East are also there. Uh, those uh, who are also coming from Western, Eastern, OT Region and Volta Region are also somewhere in the, um, I mean, around Ibri, that's where they have been camped. So at the moment, the, the aspirants are engaging them ahead of tomorrow. And we, we all do know what happens at the last minute. So they are engaging them, camping them to talk to them, sell their messages again to them. So we don't have the delegates, we don't have the aspirants, but we have some of the party supporters who are here uh, to observe what is happening. So I will just talk to some of the uh, party supporters who are here to tell us what they make of the exercise uh, for uh, tomorrow. Um, hello, sir. Uh, thank you for joining us on uh, election headquarters on Joy News. Uh, tell us your name, where you're coming from. I'm Albert from the Volta region, Anglo constituency. Right. So wh what do you have to say about the exercise so far? Uh, actually, it's a good job done. The preparations are underway. Uh, and we thank the party leadership so far for how they have put things in place. I think that tomorrow we'll have a, a very favorable condition, um, being it the weather, so that we'll be able, delegates will be able to cast their votes and um, the best candidates will win for, and, and rule our party for the next four years, so that the eight years change that we are talking about, that we want to break, we'll break it, so that this country will be at a forward move. We don't want to retrogress again, because any time we left power after eight years, when our opponents come, they put the country into retrogression. That is why we are very much uh, serious 
to actually break the eight. So because building this country for eight years, uh, it cannot be to my uh, possible uh, thinking. That, but I think that when we last a bit longer in power, Ghanaians will begin to see the core values and the principles of the MPP uh, that's the reason why the party has been established to develop. So, I'm, I'm coming to you. So, um, where, where, where are you also coming from? Uh, uh, Ashanti region. You come from the Ashanti region. Can you, can you look into my camera? You are coming from the Ashanti region. Yeah. All right. So, what are your expectations for tomorrow? Uh, all we are hoping is that uh, John Bordu. Yeah, so, uh, let's get to the main issues. Your expectation uh, before we get to that. What, what are you expecting tomorrow? Oh, I'm, I'm, uh, like what I'm saying that I'm going to expect uh, like a successful like, a conference that we are hoping for to mm. going to happen tomorrow, and we know. The, the right people are going to be chosen tomorrow. All right. Mm. So let me also find out from you. Where are you coming from? I'm coming from Takrade. Takrade, and your name is? My name is Vasco. Vasco. Yeah. Uh, what are your expectations for tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow, everything will be okay. But we are expecting John Bodo to win. All right. All right. So, uh, Evans, you, you, you heard some of the supporters so far, their views ahead of tomorrow's uh, uh, elections. And thank you very much, Samuel Mbura. And as you can see already, um, the candidates and their favorites are already uh, pitching camp uh, at the uh, Crossport Stadium. And uh, Mbura interacting with them, he's getting a first taste of how keenly contested this is going to be. Names already being thrown out there. These are non-delegates, party supporters, who throng to the place tomorrow to have the, uh, to, to, to check out what is going to happen. And it gives us a sense, right, that the entire party and their supporters will be keenly following this, hoping for their favorite candidates to win. Exactly. I mean, it's very, very important. And you know that we've talked about the NPP wanting to break the eight. And mm -hmm. so you would ask yourself that critical question, who can help you break the eight? Yeah. And, you know, in elections in our part of the world, a lot of things would happen. You have, uh, you know, those who cheer you on, uh, but they are not delegates. And so, yes, their support matters on the day mm -hmm. when your name is mentioned. They would use the noise and everything. But what really matters uh, is the delegates. Yeah. Are they the ones going to vote? Yeah. Currently, a lot of things will be happening. And uh, Samuel Mbura makes the point. We know that elections in Ghana, a few things yeah. will happen. The night before the election, what is going to happen? Where a, a lot can change tonight. A lot A lot. I mean, tonight. you can imagine the wheeling and dealing that is currently happening with the delegates, you know, you know, you know power brokers and the, the power hubs all it is a lot. Look, I, I, I was in Kofuidia, and you were there also. Yeah. You saw what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things changed yeah. at the final minute. Very, very final minute. So a lot of things can happen tonight. And if one of the contestants who stem this as an auction, I, I, I want to believe it's an election. But if, anything, if there's anything to go by, then you may say, whoever is able to do a lot tonight financially, May carry the day. Oh, absolutely. And, and here's the current crop of executives who will have to step aside tonight. And, the, and, and our smart wall is going to help us with a lot of the analysis. We have uh, graphs and charts to tell you what might happen. You know, we always want to project, right, based on history and based on trend. We'll come to that pretty shortly, who we bet may stand a better chance of winning. But this is the crop that will have to be going. Some of them are returning, some of them in the same position, others in different positions. So let's start with him. Freddie Blay, chairman two times. First time, fantastically did well, 2016. At that time, he came in, we're gonna quickly look at his legacy. Yeah. At that time, he came in, he replaced a suspended chairman. Yeah, so he was acting. He was acting yeah. chairman. And yet, he would take the credit, wouldn't he? He supervised an election that delivered the biggest margin of victory for any political party we've seen in the Fourth Republic, right? Does he take the credit for that? That's one of his biggest legacies. Well, well I mean, uh, if I were Freddie Blair, I'd take the credit. Let me be very honest with you. Of course so, they will. I, so I am not going to force Absolutely him to take the credit. Absolutely will. And so he must take the credit. Yeah. Because he was acting chairman, chairman at the time. Because if he had lost, would have blamed him. So Afoko and Co would have said, I told you. I told you. I told you. So once, I mean, once the NPP won in that election, he takes the credit. And he must take the credit because he was chairman. Uh, but you've asked the question, his legacy. Because then he would take you to 2018 as substantive, you know, uh, chairman now. He wins the election. He wins the election. Becomes substantive chairman. He went into that election promising 
to deliver buses to every constituency. Yeah, what are the buses? Well, I remember the controversy around those exactly. buses, actually. And, 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 I mean, prior to the election, prior to the election, he actually showed pictures. Yeah. He showed pictures uh, at the pots that the buses had arrived. I remember. So the question is, where are the buses? Where are the buses? And I'm sure the NPP delegates uh, would have asked him these questions if he was contesting. Yeah. And, 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 and this I mean, in this election. Well, so it's, no wonder he's not going oh, to get Oh, you can it. understand yeah. why he's not contesting. But also, more substantively, politics, elections, is all about winning the major elections. Exactly. Right? Well, that's all it's about. The chairman is at the helm there. And he, after the 2016 almost near perfection, he scored a major negative in the 2020 elections. We gave him the credit for 2016. He takes the credit for what happened in 2020, 2020 as well. The, the biggest margin of loss in parliament we've ever seen again yeah. in the Fourth you Republic. See, you see, this thing here, this thing about the MPP's performance. Yes, J.A. in 2004 had about 52%. Yeah. But let's look at things critically. In the Fourth Republic, apart from JA, uh, Jerry John Rollins, no NDC candidate has had more than 51% of the votes. That's true. So if you get more than 51% of the votes and you are the NPP, and automatically every political party, when you're getting into your second term, there'll be challenges. So yes, they had challenges, but it's also because of their expectations. See, part of the NPP. No, I mean, I, I mean, you're looking at it, but you also have to look at the two things that you're, you're, yeah. you're measuring. Yeah, I, I'll get to the parliament. parliament. I'll get to parliament. But even the presidential. Yes, I, I, even I, the presidential. No, I'll get to parliament, and, and I'll tell you why, it, when it comes to the parliamentary election, I think uh, you know, they did themselves a great disservice. I'd, I'd explain that. Mm -hmm. But this is the point. So if you look at the presidential elections in the Fourth Republic, J. E. Kufour came in with the second round the first time, in the second term, about 52%. But then, the NDC... He did better in the second term than the first term, actually. Yes, yeah. well, well, in, well... In percentage if, terms. If you look at the... Yes, yeah. in percentage terms, if you look at the first time when he got 48%. Yeah. But in the second year, about 56%. So, you know, that would probably say, oh, but he did better. But, of course, other political parties came to join him. But my point is that, automatically, mm -hmm. when you are a governing party going into an election... You expect a dip. You expect a dip. What was the NPP's problem going into election 2020? had done a financial sector cleanup. People had lost their jobs. So automatically you had a problem. There was the issue of, um, you know, the uh, fight against illegal mining. You may have, I mean, you, you, you may dispute that and say, did it really target illegal mining or it was just a camouflage? But the point, or just a smooth screen. But the point is that something was attempted. And the evidence from the central region where the MPP lost almost all the Galamse areas will send you a signal when it comes to the parliamentary elections. So the NPP itself and some of its policies was, were always going to affect the NPP's chances in election 2020. Okay, when it gets to the parliamentary. No, stay there. Mm -hmm. So that's not in doubt. Mm -hmm. But the point is about the extent of the dip. Yes. Right? My point is the, the, the gravity of that dip was significant, mm -hmm. even in the presidential elections. Remember, mm -hmm. John Mahama was dead and buried mm -hmm. by him, yes. by him, and then the president in 2016 with almost a million votes margin. Yeah. You come to 2020, Joe Mahama claws back a significant chunk 500, of that. That, that, that. that is significant claw back. My point is, he will take that as well in his sale as somebody who supervised a fantastic election in the first, yeah, we expect a dip, yeah, but not the extent to which that dip went. And now you are going to the parliamentary. But before I get that to, the also parliamentary, tells that, before I tells get to the parliamentary, let's look at the NDC of 1996. At about 57% to the NPP's 39%. 39%. And remember the Great Alliance, J. E. Kufour and the PCP, went into the Great Alliance and had 39%. Mm -hmm. In 2000, by the end of the first one, he had 48%. Look at it. That's 9% increase. So that's the NDC in 20, uh, from 1996 to 2000. If you are the NPP and you saw a dip about you know, 53, 54%, then you've come to 51%, take it like that. I understand you, but the reality also is that by 2020, a lot of Ghanaians had become disappointed with the NPP's government. Yeah, I mean, you can't run away that's from true. that. So we're expecting a dip, but I, I guess we, uh, we all agree. We agree. That no. as for the dip, as for the yes. dip, was the dip that they expected 
um, one that indeed was commensurate with the challenges that he had. My argument is that that dip was too steep and he takes the credit. But then let's go to the next one. John Boudou, we'll come to John Boudou, so we're not going to spend too much time on him. I mean, he is part of this current crop that delivered that woeful performance in Parliament and, of course, lost a lot of votes in the presidential as well. Many blame him. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, for him, he's no longer in the picture. But many blame him for that outcome. He's standing again. He's trying to retain that seat for a third time. For a third time. Yes, you know, he was, um, he was acting secretary also. So yeah. Uh, you probably may say, oh, I am now going for my second term. But uh, he was in there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> he was in there. He was, he was, uh, he was organizer, then, then acted secretary, secretary yes. and then moved on. So, yeah, I mean, we'll come to him. We'll come to him. We'll come to him substantively. Yeah. I mean, he's also going again. Yes, he wants to be chairman. Now. Not national treasurer. He wants to be chairman. I, I personally believe it is a massive leap, right, mm -hmm. to jump from national treasurer to national chairman. Well, you, I mean, I can agree with you. It, it, it's, it's too steep a climb. Yeah, but then the question will be, if he doesn't want to be treasurer again, mm. where does he go? Mm -hmm. Would he want to contest John Buedu and become, you know, would he want to contest John Buedu and become secretary, I mean, general secretary of the NPP? He probably may say, I don't want to do that. So if he doesn't want to do that, then where does he go? The current chairman says, I am not going to contest the election. He can, he can contest the national so, organizer position. Well, well, but he can do that. In, that. in that current crop of executives, we had Samir Oku and Alison Chimana Sempa the last time when he talked about the fact that he had indicated he wasn't going to contest the election again. But while he had said he wasn't going to contest the election again, he knew, for instance, that Nanabi, Henry Nanabwache, whom we will come to, had told him yeah, let's he, do that. that he wants to replace him. And so once Nanabwache said... Did you, get a, did you get a sense that he gave him his blessing? Well, let me go to 2018, and I'll come back to it. In 2018, when John, uh, Samuel Oku was asked whom he was supporting in the election, at the time he talked about how his deputy at the time was uh, Dominic Idia. And so Dominic Idia was contesting, wanting to succeed him. And Nanabi has also been very active in the youth front. And so for him, he wasn't even going to vote yeah. in that particular election. But after the elections, and the man is beginning to go on that same path. Uh, Samia Oku started, he became youth organizer. Then he uh, became national it's almost organizer. following. So this man here, youth organizer, now wanting to be national organizer. And watch this critically. This man here, youth organizer, national organizer, general secretary. But Samia Oku then decides, I don't want to be general secretary. Mm -hmm. I want to get out of it join the executive, and so this man here wants to take over. Um, well, let's see. So, so there's, there wasn't anything obvious that he is, he is backing him? No, I, I, I can't say that, I can't say that okay. for now. But you see, I can't say that for now. But um, listening to him, you probably would have a sense. You'd have a sense that at least he, doesn't yeah, he doesn't yeah, mind. He doesn't mind having with him. as a national yeah. And then, of course, we have Kate Jim Fua. She's been there. And we'll come to him here because she's going again yeah, she's as, going a, as, a, as a national women's organizer uh, for, for the party. And so, indeed, that's, a, that's an important thing to, to note. And, of course, you have Abdul Aziz uh, Haruna Abdul Futa, Futa. A national NASARA coordinator. And, and uh, my first engagement with him was when he was the uh, House of Folk uh, chapter, I think chapter O, chapter 9. Oh, uh, is yeah, it, you is know, it a musical uh, group? No, no, they're the supporters. <laughs> so, so he has a strong base mm -hmm. um, in, in, in Nima and other places that they need to come to the table with. Uh, and so, so these are the current crop uh, of leaders. Um, he's going to go completely out of the picture. He's going to go completely out of the picture. Um, she is hoping that tomorrow she'll be retaining this position. He is making the climb, um, ascending, hopefully, to this particular position here that Freddie Blay will be vacating. He is hoping that he's retained uh, in this position. Um, as you know, Samo Uku is no longer going to contest, and we have uh, insights about where he may be going. That's a conversation for, for later. Um, he's still there, yeah, um, he's hoping there. Uh, to, um, as the Nasara coordinator, still be there. Henry Nanabwache, who is a national youth organizer currently, is hoping to step in the shoes of Sami Uku. So that's the picture of the current crop and how they may change uh, going forward. Okay, now this is the big thing though that we've all been talking about, the big agenda. Whatever the outcome tomorrow is, 
they will be attempting the impossible, an attempt to make history as the only party to break the eight. And, and that has never been, been done before. And so that's what the party is going to be doing. So you, you begin to appreciate what the difficulty is. And, and very briefly on that point, how, how much of this will be weighing on the minds or should be weighing on the minds of the delegates tomorrow when they go to make that decision? Look, I think the theme for the Congress says it all. It's one of the things they've been thinking about. Mm. And right after election 2020, you saw the flyers breaking the eight with uh, Baumia and Alan Sherman Ting. Like, automatically, the MPP is beginning to think about how do we ensure that we're able to win the next election? That's not a bad thing to do. And history will tell you that um, the MPP has not been bad at trying to break the eight because in 20, uh, 2008, then candidate Akufuado had, you know, 49%, 49 point, uh, you know, um, 7%, but 49 point something percent in the first round. He was very close to it. In the second round, he lost it. He lost it by 40,000. So there's been that kind of, you know, the NPP getting very close to breaking the aid. <laughs> that has not happened in our politics before. Yeah. And so what that should tell you automatically is that in this election, the NPP would go into the election as the underdog. Yeah, we'll, in fact, we have a whole slide to analyze that. We'll come to that substantively. But most important thing you're saying is, for the delegates going to the polls tomorrow, Forget about anything else. It is about this Breaking agenda. Breaking the eight. It's about this big agenda that you see on your screen here that they need to be, they need to be the following. Most, that's the most important thing on the minds of all NPP delegates currently. How do we ensure that we are able to elect the crop of leaders who would be able to help us break the eight? Yeah. Now, we've said that has not been possible in our politics so far. Can it be possible this time? We are yet to find out. 2024 is two years away. But who are the people to lead the NPP? Yeah. Into so, so here, let's go there. Let's go there. So we, this, is, this is there. So let's now do a historical for you before we get into it. Because this will help you begin to see a certain trend emerging so that you understand what is going to happen tomorrow. We found this very useful because... We're going way back to 2001, yeah. right? Yeah. Right after the MPP had won their first elections yeah. in the Fourth Republic. Now, and this was the contest then, the internal contest. So back then, they will be preparing, just like tomorrow, to elect these people. And at that time, you had Harun Esuku yeah. in that contest winning 348 votes. Yeah. And so he became the national, the national chairman at the time. We have national organizer, um, in this case, Lord Oblite Komi, who, of course, is the director of operations currently. Currently, The general secretary was Damboche, right? And, and so Harun Esuku, Lord Komi, Damboche. Formidable team. Mm -hmm. Formidable team. And, and no wonder, in the next elections week they supervise, which is in 20, 2024 elections, it's possibly the only time when from one election to the next, the incumbent party in the, in the next elections didn't do too badly in terms of the dip that we experienced. Exactly, exactly. I mean, if you look at it... If, but they appreciate it. If you look at it from the first round of yes, votes. Yes, first round of votes, and yeah. Normally, for purposes of analysis, we may want to take the first round of votes. Yeah. We use the first round of votes because there are alliances in the second round. Yeah. Now, how you're able to manage those alliances for, you know, for the years ahead is up to you. Yeah. But I would say, let's use the I mean, first round of election. And the yeah. first round of election showed that the MPP had some, you know, 48% of the votes. Mm -hmm. And based on that, you'd say there was actually an appreciation because then it increases to 52%. Okay. Now, but I want you to focus on something I'm going to, you know, circle for you. Here. This is back, way back in... Why is this important? Well, this is very important because this is the first time we hear of this man. Stephen Ayensu in team. Then he becomes the first vice chairman of the NPP. Yeah. So prior to this particular election, we didn't, you, didn't, you probably didn't know much about him. He was in the NPP, helping the NPP. But then he becomes the first vice chairman of the NPP. That's, that's in 2001. And that's very important. Yeah. And then we go to 2005. Five, the yeah. next time 
the, the party holds a national executive elections. Peter Magmenu emerges the winner. And, and, and then again... Exactly, Evans. And, and, and I remember this election like yesterday. Yeah. I remember this election very, very well. Initially, you had Harun Esiku yeah. as part of the uh, you know, contestants for chairmanship. And I'm sure if you remember, the famous kickback. Yeah. The famous kickback team. So eventually, Harun Esiku steps out of the race, leaving Peter McMenu and Stephen Ayensu in team. Here, the NPP talked about breaking the eight. And then as a student at the university, one of the things we were discussing those days, and uh, well, if we were to go into the youth organizership race, I would have shown you something. Uh, later on, I'll tell you about that uh, before we wrap it up. But let me just say it, because that was also the first time that Pius Enam Hajide also showed up. Also showed up. And this was the first time that John Buedu also became the youth organizer. We'll come to John Buedu's case. But here, the NPP started having a conversation about breaking the AIDS. And they said the party needed a strategist. Who was that strategist? They felt that having led the Western region, Peter McMenu, he was the one going to help the party to break the eight. Mm -hmm. So even though Stephen and team at the time had been very resourceful, they had been helping the party, the feeling within the grassroots of the party at the time was that the party needed somebody who can help them. The party needed a grounds person. The party needed a strategist. And that strategist was this man, Peter McMahon. At that time. At that time. So that's, that's why he won, that's fundamentally. He won. fundamentally. The fundamentally. delegates were because, convinced. Because at the time, and I'm not going to mince words here, I'm going to say it, because later on we're also going to look at another factor in this election. And that factor will be the role of the system. When we say the role of the system, we're talking about the role of the presidency. So what role does the presidency in those... Who was the system candidate here? Here. He was a system candidate. Yeah. Because in that time, yeah. Kufo was firmly in, in his corner. of the party. Yeah. In fact, in that time, there had been attempts to actually make the president the leader of the NPP, as you have it, in the NDC. Yeah. That did not happen. Uh, you probably may have heard of the struggles and at the time, you know, um, someone like Dan Butry making the point that, no, let the chairman continue being the leader of the NPP, whether in government or in opposition. This man here, at the time, in the minds of a lot of the delegates, was the system candidate. He did not win. Okay, so, so, so bear attention to this. The fact that, the, this is the, one of the key things, the fact that you are a system candidate doesn't automatically mean that you will win favor with the delegates. Exactly. And it was proven in 2005. Mm -hmm. And when we come to the current crop of contestants and candidates, they are system candidates in there. Mm -hmm. There's never a time when an incumbent president doesn't have a favorite. Oh, they right? Do. I mean, everybody has a favorite yeah. because they'll be voting, indeed, um, when it comes to this. But one of the things that caught my attention when I looked at this is how close, how close the results were then. Yes. And, and my point I'm, I was, that struck me with this is that Stephen in team isn't really such a bad candidate. Right? He, all the times I tried. Because he was a system candidate. He was supposed to win. Mm -hmm. He lost. But the margin isn't that significant. Because if you go to the next election, you begin to see what I'm saying about his... About... So Jake Otanko, Betty Vellante won. Okay, but Stephen in team. Then drops significantly. Well, Stephen, uh, so this is actually Stephen in team's vote? Th yeah, this is Stephen in team. Uh, this is Stephen in team. A, a thousand... So, so this... This is what we call transpositional error. Right, <laughs> as the as we see we saw in the, in the Supreme Court. So that's him. So again, he's always in the second place. No, so so you see, I'm he's sure. always in the second place. Yes, uh, Stephen and Tim has been very close to it. We say he gets so close, then he drops. He's been four times close. Yeah, and you this see, is like two hundred. Yeah, votes yeah. This different. is like yes, um, two hundred and twenty-six. Yeah, no, votes. yes, two hundred and twenty-six votes difference. Yeah, and in this particular election. Stephen Intim was actually in the lead prior to the election. He was leading until the last minute. Until the last minute in Kumase when he lost that election. But of course, I'm, I'm sure it would interest people also that, um, so in this particular election, you had uh, Sami Krab getting, uh, you know, 20, 43, and Charles Rakubobe was in there. Yeah, about 29 but yeah but very, very small marginal. Small, small margins. But margins. Evans, let's go back to 2005. I want us to do something. Okay. So let's look at this critically. This is the NPP's attempt to breaking the eight in 2000. Yep. What did they do with their national executive positions? What did they do in that election? You had a new chairman, Peter McMenu, new general secretary, 
Nano Hininto, and a retained national organizer. Mm -hmm. Think about that for a minute. The other time they wanted to seek re-election, and let's go to 2001, and I'll show you something in 2001. In 2001, Dan Butri was the general secretary at the time, and he was maintained. Of course, in 2001, Samuel Ode Sykes, who was national chairman of the NPP, didn't seek re-election, and so Harun Eseku came in. Mm -hmm. My thing, and I've been trying to understand this, mm -hmm. and, 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 and let's get to 2005. When Dan Botry then moved into the executive with a new general secretary, the NPP could not break the eight. Mm -hmm. We started by talking about the fact that if you are a John Brady, you probably would say, well, I was general secretary in 2015, and then so we went in 2016 with me as general secretary. So I won the election for you as general secretary, and I made sure you won the election again as general secretary in 2020 elections. Now, if what happened in the Dan Butry case is anything to go by, where the new person who brought them into office, when maintained, was able to get the NPP re-elected. Then, when they changed general secretary, the party lost. My question is, are there any lessons okay. that a party can learn? So you're saying that, if you look at that, mm -hmm. the possibility is that possibly it's best to maintain your general secretary? Well, I'm going to answer that question later on. Okay. I've just drawn your we'll attention. Go. Yeah, I mean, but it's a, it's a very important yes. thing to do. Yes. I mean, because you all, you, in politics, it's good to look to history. Yeah. I mean, because it gives you a setting, you know, sense of where you are and where you're going. Then we come to 2010. Yes. And we've already talked about, again, the civil factor. Factory, factory. I mean, we said this is the transpositional error, but he, his was the... Thousand... The, uh, the thousand eight hundred and four. So he's always in that second position. And you see that uh, Obeite Bilamte, who was credited with a lot. Yes. Um, in terms of his ability to, you know, help them win the 20, 2000 elections. 2000 elections, he was campaign manager in 2000. So that would actually lead me to a certain observation. Yeah. And as we go on, we'll find this. So in 2005, it was a Peter Mark Menu, stalwart in the party, known in the Western region, credited with all the, you know, beautiful things the party mm -hmm. did in the Western region. Then in 2010, Jake Obechebilamte comes in. Now, Jake Obechebilamte, known, his father is Emmanuel Obechebilamte. I mean, for those who, do, who are not aware, one of the, if you look at some of the pictures of uh, Professor K. Buzia, you see Jacob Obeche Bilamte in there, a very young man helping protect or guard Dr. K. A. Buzia at the time. He had always been in the NPP. But then something happens in 2014. Okay. I want us to go to 2014 again. Still focusing on Stephen and team. Now, this margin was, is, is huge. Yeah, this one then begins this to widen. Huge. Begins to widen. Now, this is what happened. Paul Afoku. So, Paul Afoku... And I must say, this is possibly one of the most consequential national elections because the outcomes here had nearly lost them the 2016 election. Mm -hmm. Nearly. But, yeah, yeah, you're making a point. Yeah, so, Paul Afoku, known as a businessman. Paul Afoku, known as NPP. In fact, one of the people who challenged the uh, 1981 uh, you know, coup in Bogatanga. At the time, he fled the country, came back when J. Kufo became president. We know of his business interests. And I, I, I first encountered him in 2004, the two th was it the 2004 elections? Ye the, yes, the one at, at um, University of Ghana. 2007. Oh, that's a 2007, 2007 yes, yeah. yes. That's the 2007 elections, yeah. yes, the national election. Yeah. That's when they were electing the yeah. presidential candidate. He was such a central figure because of the controversy that he was involved exactly. in, in the corner of Alan Chairman then. Exactly, then. exactly. You know, and so he's been a very well-known not apologetic, Kufo loyalists, mm -hmm. but an Alan loyalist as well. So I'll do some analysis here shortly. But then, so this man, Paul Afoko, unlike the Peter McMenu situation where we say Peter McMenu is the Western Regional Chairman of the NPP, then decides to become national chairman, so he's known. Jacob H. Bilamte was twice Greater Accra Regional Chairman of the NPP, has been a uh, campaign manager before. So Jacob H. Bilamte decides to be, I mean, national chairman. He's known. But this man, at the time, not occupying, have not having occupied any position in the NPP, but then steps forward and still defeats the winning team. Absolutely. And that, that was fascinating. Yeah. Because remember the point you made about the system candidate? Exactly. He was a system candidate. Well, Paula Kufo. Paula Foko at the time. No, at this time. No, I mean, oh, sorry. He was a Kufo. He was, he was the, he was, he was, he was a Kufo. Uh, but sorry, sorry. That's, that's a very important point. He wasn't a system because at that time, 
we knew that you know the uh, Nana Kufuor was so very influential. So, no, at, the, at that time, Nana Kufuor was very influential. And I'm going to tell you something. I know what I'm going to say, but I say it. I know this is going to be controversial, but I say it. Now, this man was the Akufuado candidate in 2010. Mm -hmm. In 2020, so here, he was the candidate. Then, in 2014, a lot of things were beginning to happen. A few days to the conference. I remember very well on the Congress rounds, some flip-flopping that was happening. A lot of people who were Kufo loyalists initially wanted to, some of them had wanted to vote for this man. Yeah. But then they said, no, we are not going to vote for this man. But in the build-up to the elections, all of a sudden, Nana Kufuado, who many thought at the time was supporting this man, made a use of weight behind this man. Yeah, and, and that sort of played to his advantage. I mean, and, 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 and so automatically, so look at it critically. If you're looking at these numbers, Paul Afoku at the time, and he said it before in some discussions, he said he was looking for a northern person as a chairman of the NPP. He felt the NPP had never had a northern chairman. So he was talking to a lot of the northern uh, persons within the NPP. And somebody said to him, have you thought about yourself? Yeah, and he put himself out. And he put himself out there. And I know at the time that Paul Afoku actually had to try to convince a lot of the elements within the other side of the party who were rooting for Stephen and Tim. But no as point. we move forward, I'm going to tell you something. Yeah, and because Stephen and Tim today has become a neutral person in the NP. So, so you begin to see the Stephen and Tim trend and his performance. We'll show you a graph of we, we plotted a trend because he's been there. So you can track and do a trend analysis whether his fortunes are on an upward trajectory or downward, and what that tells, about, tells us about what possibly could happen tomorrow. But then, of course, we need to say a thing about Kamenei Japan, who, of course, went in and they both won when nobody thought that they, they had any right to, but they won. And the consequences of this, and, and, and this is Kujo Usifri. This was a time when Sir John, Sir John. He, made, he made a famous quote that fear delegates. And I'll tell you one. I'll tell you one. And, and by the way, but you know, don't forget, a very important entrant mm -hmm. into the executive race then was um, John Buedu. Who was then, so John Buedu would come in at that point in time, but John Buedu actually came in in 2005, yeah. then as National Youth Organizer. Organizer. And in I, that particular election, he beat, um, you know, Pyle Sanam Hajide, he beat um, Michael Ampong yeah. to become National Youth Organizer. He lost in 2010 mm. to Mokta Bamba. Yeah. In his quest to become national, but, but something that but something that this tells me that John Bodu has been a very popular um, uh, sort of in, in when he contests, he's very popular with the delegates. He he, he is. I mean, I mean, I no mean, doubt because he wasn't, he, he wasn't that popular in 2010 yeah. with the delegates, but he was very popular in 2014 with the yeah. delegates. And I was in Tamale, in Tamale at the time when his name was mentioned as uh, one of the aspirants. I know in, in Tamale. Uh, they just mentioned, you, you, you give a wave, you know, the uproar in the room at the time was indicative of a man who was loved by a lot of people. Now, Mokta Bamba at the time, who was the incumbent, had just 474 votes. He performed poorly. Even Hope Adoye, also a new entrant at the time, did, well. did better mm -hmm. than Mokta Bamba. But let's get to 2008, I mean 2014. This is supposed to be 2014. There's a 2014 election. Uh, let's get to the 2014. So yes, yes, here, here we are. No, let's go back. Yeah, still with the 2004 election, uh, 14 election. So let's deal with this one. This is the 2014 election. Now, this is where Kwabne Japon yeah. shows up, and he was no new person in the NP. Yeah, he's been there. He's been he's, he's been before his right hand man for a while. He's, I mean, he's known. So this was not the time. This was not a new entrant. Yeah, but, but, but many tipped Sir John to win that race. Well, why well, many tipped Sir John to win that race? This was. After Sir John had his hands at his back in the Supreme Court, asked, do you now see your size? <laughs> now, for a lot of the NPP people, they saw this as a kind of um, a demeanor for the party. For 
For those of us who spoke with the NPP delegates at the time, you probably heard some of them saying, this is not what is expected of an NPP general secretary. Kwabne Japon came in at the time, and he came in with some finesse. He came in, I mean, a smooth talker. There were people who felt that Sir John's buga buga politics was not the NPP way of doing things. Okay? It's an elitist party. It's an elitist I mean, yeah, it's an elitist I mean, party. He, he, he's, he's, more, he's more like um, his good friend I in the end, this yeah. Asirin case. It's more like Johnson Asirin yeah. I mean, let's, not, let, let's be very blunt here. It's just like him. And the NPP felt at the time that they did not need him mm. to be in there. Yeah. So, I mean, so that's the story. And let's, like, we're going to be wrapping up show and go to the current crop now. Mm -hmm. so, so we get to the 2018 national and, election. And so let, let's get to the other slide. I mean, let's get to the Stephen Team factors. No, let's move forward. Uh, let's move forward straightly, uh, straight to the Stephen Team thing. Yes, I want to do something there. Let's move forward. Okay, no, let's go to Stephen Team. So the, ne so the next one, uh, no, the next one, let's get to Stephen Team. I want to do something. Good. So this is in Team's performance. Watch it from 40% as first vice chairman, he won. Then 47%, he lost. So he, even though he, his votes improve, yeah. he this tells a better story. This tells a better story. This so tells a better story watch it. because you begin to see the, his performance over time. I'm, I'm going to take this off yeah. uh, here. Good. Yeah. Let's look at it carefully. Yes, so now let's just uh, show you. From 40% to 47%, you begin to see some improvement. Yeah, I mean, so, so clearly, when you watch this, he starts off in 2001, yeah. and then he climbs. Exactly. Right, he climbs, he trends upwards in 2005 when he, I mean, uh, when, when, he, when he stands again, mm -hmm. and then he begins to drop. Exactly. He begins to drop in the 2010 elections when he stood again, and it's been on the downward trajectory, right? Yeah. However, the last time he did, the last time he did to now, he's on an upward trajectory. He is, because well, in this election, uh, let's be, let me just circle this again. Uh, yeah, you could. Uh, so in this election... Let me give you, let me give you a, one is, that... Yes, um, yes, I mean, give me a black so I could, uh, uh, so that I could just show you. In this election, yeah, well, so in this election, that's when you had Fred Owari showing up in this election. Okay. So this is the Afoku in team Owari election. Yeah. Fred Owari has about 1,100. Afoku has 2,000, over 2,000. You have Stephen in team with 1,500. Mm. And I remember, so this particular election was a very difficult election. This particular election was yeah. very, very difficult. And I remember the time when the results were declared. Stephen in team showed up there and gave the concession speech. And in that speech, when he talks about once again, Stephen in team has lost, but the party has won. But you see an improvement in 2018. Unfortunately, still not able to get him the chairmanship of the NP. But most importantly, Trend analysis tell you a story. He has the momentum on his side. Yes. Right? Because he is now on an upward trajectory. But he's been on an upward trajectory before. before. So you see? Except, before. except, yeah. except that the, 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 the climb is steeper here. Yeah. Right? This was a gentle climb. 7%. Right? But if you, look at, if you look at from 37, 31 to 45, that is a steeper climb up. Yeah. So you could say that, yes, it's been on an upward climb before, but if you compare the two climbs, of course, he is doing better here mm -hmm. than there. Yeah. So is it fair to assume that if you do this analysis for him, then it's true that possibly this time, this should result, this climb should continue? Well, let me introduce another factor. So the time you had a lot of people contesting you had, you know, strong people contesting. This is the performance he showed up with. When he had Fred Owari, Paula Foucault, and he himself, and okay. himself, this is the performance. Today, tomorrow. Not of a huge field. No, not a huge field per se. Okay. But who are the contestants? Okay. What do they bring? What are their weights in the NPP? Can we look at them in the NPP and say, because of the kind of... Uh, you know, uh, relevance they have in the NPP, they may just hurt Stephen in team's chances. Well, we'll come to that. We'll come to that. But if Stephen in team is watching this, I don't know whether he's got his researchers to look, to, to look at um, this for him, but the trend we've plotted, and you've seen it on your screen here, and let's show that to them. The trend we plotted shows clearly that he has the wind in his sail. If I were him, I'll be learning from what happened here 
and what happened here. Because you don't, what you don't want to repeat is what happened from, from 47%, from 2005 to 2010. So you're learning your lessons here. Yeah. But you want to repeat, you want to re do more of what you did between 2001 and 2005 because there was a climb. Yeah. Right? And then you're climbing again. He didn't sustain the climb the first time he had it. Mm -hmm. He dropped it. The key question he needs to be asking himself is, can I sustain this climb tomorrow? Can I sustain this climb that I'm on, this momentum? Can it take me to win? Whatever he did here, he must do more of here. If, if, depending on how the election goes, yeah. if Stephen Intim is able, is able to maintain this, he could win. Absolutely. Because you have a lot of people in there. You have, uh, Absolutely. You have uh, Abankwaye Bo. Absolutely. You have Professor Christopher Mayokunfi. Stephen Asamoah Boate. A lot of heavyweights. Yes, a lot have, of heavyweights. Uh, you know, you know, Gifty Aya, Daviyama, who is a former national treasurer yeah. of BNP. And, and that is why research like this is important. Because you, immediately you see this, you're asking yourself, okay, so I have two similar periods of good, consistent trend climb, right? I was trending upwards. What did I do in the first upward trajectory? And what did I do in a second? Can I repeat both or do more of? Yeah. Because if you, if you don't profit this way, you will not know, you're not knowing, because again, he's doing that. He, he must have learned the lessons. Oh, well, he, he, he must have. He must and, have and, learned the lessons. And, and, and that's why I'm saying that, look, I, I saw Stephen in Tim in 2018, and I've seen him in 2021 also. And in 2018, when I saw him, when he got into Kofuridia at the time, with the same mantra, time mm -hmm. And I saw him, you know, showing you know, his wrist. He's, still, he's still doing, he's still doing his wrist. And I mean, and, and he said, time as well, time as well, time as well. In 2021, 2022, he's doing the same thing, time as well. Just that this time, it seems that Stephen and Tim has learned his lessons. Okay, let's see. And, 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 and I say he's learned his lessons because this time around, you see a candidate who's loved by both sides. You see a candidate who says, I am prepared to give you a precedent. You see a candidate who, who is not going in there as the representative from a particular block. Okay. You see a Stephen in team who's just like, I want and to And everything you've said, the only element that he didn't have before or that is unique about him now is the point about both sides possibly yeah. being a neutral person. Right. But let's do the same for John Wiru mm -hmm. because he too has been in the race for quite a while, right? So you can also do a trend analysis for him. This is a John Wiru story. Uh, and this tells a story too. And again, if you look at John Budu, he had a significant dip yeah. between 2005 and 2010. Yeah. Since then, he's been on an upward trajectory. Exactly. Except, except that the rate of climb seemed to have slowed. Exactly. In and the last why, two, in the last two elections, he's contested. Why, why has the so this particular time? So this is what we talked about the Moktababa and um, you know. Uh, Hobson Adoya election. Yeah. I think that John Wedu did not perform well here. And I'll explain. But that's 77%. Oh, yeah, no, no, no doubt. You had a Richard Ayaba, okay, returning from the US to contest John Wedu, and he put a, I mean, over a thousand votes. That is significant because he just showed up. That would tell you, that would send you a signal. And the signal it sends to you. Now, this was more like a yes or no vote for John Wedu in 2018. Uh, uh, yes, it was just like a yes or no vote for him. So if he returned this margin, I'm sure he looked at it and said, I did not perform well. Mm. But that notwithstanding. So you're expecting him to have done close to 90? He should have done about 90%. Because of, of, because of who he was, he was contesting was at that against. And, okay. I mean, and, and I was in Kofuria and I saw uh, you know, Richard Ahiagba at the time begging delegates to vote. Nobody even knew him. Yeah, exactly. Nobody knew him. So, so I get your point. I get your point. Because of the, of, of the quality of the opposition, yes. he should have done far better than 77. Than 77. Okay. okay, I get it. But if you're John Boehner, you're looking at this, you shouldn't be too worried about tomorrow. No, you should Except, shouldn't. except, except, again, you're considering who else exactly. is in the race with me. We'll come there shortly. Another thing I wanted, wanted to show you, um, as far as the trend is concerned, is this, um, Winston. This is key. This is Stephen and team versus... The, this is the GAB analysis, yeah. okay? If you look at Stephen in team, uh, that is the, who, in terms of who wins, each time he's contested, whoever has won, has he been closing the gap over time or has the gap been widening? And this tells another story. If Stephen in team and his team 
are watching, this is something that should worry them. Because when the first time he came in to contest, the gap was closed. Yeah. The next time he did, the gap widened. Mm -hmm. It appears that each time he's contested, according to this trend analysis and the, and the gap analysis, the gap keeps widening. So here, you see a gap of... So Stephen and team is your red. Mm -hmm. so and, yeah. and whoever won in, in each of the elections that mm -hmm. he did is your, is your blue. Yeah, and so you see the gaps there. Now, write 532 on the screen. 532. Here. Or here, write 506. Good. So this is the margin by which he lost in 2014. So that was... And this is in 20. 18. Okay. So what happened here? Well, you can see. So yes, here yeah, he lost. But you know, uh, in this particular election, in this election, who was a system candidate at the time? Yeah. It's very important. Now, you had Freddie Blay, who was promising buses, <laughs> contesting a Stephen in team who said, time us on. Freddie Blay, the darling boy of... Freddie Blay, who, darling boy of Akufuado. Freddie Blay, the man who, you know, uh, was very bold when, he's, when he was asked the question, what are people defying party uh, rules and supporting Akufuado? He said some rules are better defied. So, I mean, you, 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 you knew that Freddie Blay was going to give Stephen and team a run for his money. In this election, Professor, uh, uh, Dr. Rich, uh, Richard uh, Amakumba, he had uh, 18 votes. Yeah, and by the way, he's going to be our guest tomorrow in our special comprehensive coverage. He's been there before. He's contested like, you know, and he's going to be in the studio. So he will be sharing very interesting insights. You don't want to miss uh, Professor Makuba, who is joining us tomorrow. Dr. Makuba, who joins us tomorrow as part of our coverage. So if you look at this, you probably would say, yeah, you can pardon him a bit. An insignificant. Okay. So, so then, then the first conclusion that this shows us will hold. Although the gap is widening, he still has the momentum he does. going into, he does. into this election. He still has the momentum exactly. going into this and election. If you are any candidate for chairmanship, Stephen and team is the man to beat. To beat. If the NPP's uh, I mean, mantra of rewarding, re 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 rewarding loyalty is anything to go by, then the NPP, I'm sure it's time for them maybe to reward Stephen and team. This is his fifth time. And I say he's learned from his lessons. Mm -hmm. But of course, I am not a delegate. And the delegates <laughs> decide on the They will. You know. Listen, we are going to take a quick break. When we return, we are going to now isolate the various candidates and the field. We've isolated the bit. We're giving you a trend analysis and the history. Now, let's look at the candidates on the ballot tomorrow. Their strengths, their weaknesses, who is likely to win, who is likely to lose. And you've seen a bit of the story beginning to emerge and then we'll end with the big picture the npp itself what this will mean for the party attempting to break the eight and then we'll tell you a very interesting story about the relationship between an imf program and your chances of winning an election as if an attempt to the attempt to break the eight is not a herculean tax already which nobody had done what else that the decision to go to the IMF say about the NPP's chance. Whoever wins will tell you what are his chances if you were using only, we have a model, we have a model that we've developed on this. If you're using only the IMF decision as your gauge and your variable, is that an accurate predictor of what might happen regardless of who they elect tomorrow? You want to stay with us after this break we we'll get into that analysis for you here on your election headquarters on the special election eve program as we build up to tomorrow. Stay with us. And thank you very much for staying with us. This is your election headquarters. Nobody, absolutely nobody does it like we do. Because uh, when it has to be elections, there's only one place you want to be, whether it's a party, internal elections, the national elections, or the general elections, it is your election headquarters. Tonight we are focusing on the MPP. Tomorrow, they go to the polls. You could be electing national executives that will lead it in an attempt to break the eight. 
And we've been walking you through, in the last um, one hour plus, we've been walking you through the various permutations, giving a historical perspective, uh, and also telling you why you should care about what is going to happen in the MPP uh, tomorrow. So we're now at the point where we can now isolate the field and look at each of the positions and which of these candidates possibly stand a better chance of making it through it and who they are. If you followed us already for the last two or three weeks, we've been doing a series building up to this, introducing you to the candidates. But so let's compress that now in the next few minutes before we move on to the big picture. So here is Davi Ama Gifti Asantua Ayer. So this is the national chairperson race. And so these are the various um, individuals who are putting themselves up. But I, want, I need to say something about Davi. It's interesting that Davi was used to be the treasurer. Yeah, she was the treasurer. But she was the first female treasurer, treasurer yes. of, the, of the MPP. MPP. Now, what I found interesting is, she did an interview in which she, was, she, she berated all of them for attempting to buy votes. And she said they must stop. Because she, then they asked her, but if you don't pay, you win. You know what she said? She said, well, I'm not going to give them one CD. And her argument was, they should remember what she has done for the party. Yeah. And that as the national, as the first woman treasurer, she bought chairs. For <laughs> constituencies. <laughs> like, but, but, will that resonate? And it makes a very important point, though. Her emphasis was service to the party must be more important than your ability to pay your way through a vote. Let me tell you what I like about Davi Amaro, that she's contesting. That's what I love about her. Yeah. And I, I, I'd use the Dr. Edward Mahama analogy to do something. So Dr. Edward Mahama, whenever he contested elections, knew from the beginning he wasn't going to win, but he sought to influence policy, mm -hmm. shape policy by contesting an election. That's what Avi Amma is trying to do. I'm happy she's contesting because you have somebody, just like Prof I mean, Dr. Richard Amakumba, yeah. she may perform better than Dr. Yeah. Richard Amakumba. I mean, and the fact that and she's the only woman on the yes. on, on the and ballot. so she's in there and making the case that this is not how we should run a political party. It must not be the election for the highest bidder. And so whoever is able to pay us more gets to win at the end of the day. And so, yes, um, it's, it's, I mean, it's refreshing to note that a lady has put herself up for, uh, I mean, the election. There were a lot of people who thought that Hawa Yakubu, of blessed memory, would have been the first person because she became uh, you know, vice chairperson of the NPP yeah. in 2005. Yeah, well, so that's her, and that's what we know about her. So very interesting, only woman on the field. And then you have Sami Krab. Sami Krab is a controversial candidate for me. Yeah. It is. Why do I say that? He was part of the Afoko Kanadipon, you know, gang that became very controversial back in the day. He was also suspended yeah. together with Afoko and Kwabena Japan. And the thing, and in the lead up to this, many have said, you know, the, his suspension wasn't exactly lifted. No. But, you know, but he's made a very smart argument. He said, I was suspended as the vice chair of the party, was he not? Yeah. Um, but I was not suspended as a member of the MPP. So as a member of the MPP, I enjoy the same rights as everybody else. Mm -hmm. So I can contest. Um, you may not have lifted my suspension as a vice chair, but you didn't sack me from the party or you didn't suspend me as a party member. And as a party member, I am entitled to contest for any position in the party and indeed, he went to the vetting and he was cleared. Yes. And so, I mean, by, by, by virtue of being cleared from the vetting, it's obvious that uh, his suspension, I mean, so he can contest. Yeah. But Sonny Crab is interesting because in 2010, he wanted to be chairman. Yeah. Then in 2014, he decides to be vice chairman. Yeah. And that was also very controversial. Very controversial. In 2018, he actually wanted to contest. Again. Again. At the time, he was warned that if he stepped foot in the party's head office, there will be bloodshed. Absolutely. He didn't show up. He said, I am not the one to go and destroy the NPP. I am not going to go in there. And I know the people who advised him that he should be bold, he should be a man, and go there. He says, I would do no such thing. Uh, I see this, I see this as an attempt for recognition. Well, that's true. That's true. And here's the thing, though. So you're wondering, so what really did he do? The accusations against him back then was that he brought the he made alterances and acted in ways that brought the party's name into disrepute, and so they suspended him. Has he completely purged himself of those accusations? I don't know. 
the delegates will have to decide that tomorrow. But you're right. I mean, he's well aware that the system, as you say, will not want him. Mm -hmm. But he wants to be there. No, yeah. The, the same reason why we know that Kwame Jepon might also throw in his hat to become the presidential President, candidate yes. of the party. Because if you do that, depending on how many votes you get, you may begin to get legitimacy again. People exactly. will now know, well, you, you have a certain base yeah. in the party still. So he wants to test that tomorrow, and we wish him well. And, 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 and he's well resourced, so. Yeah, he wish him well. That. Now, honestly, one of the individuals who you know, surprised me a bit will be Professor Maya Kunfi. I never suspected that he would contest for the chairmanship. I, I didn't. Why? Because he seemed to have dropped off the radar after his Kufu, you know, when, after his long years of service under the Kufu administration as the education minister, but then also becomes the railway minister exactly. under Kufu. What's a railway development? You know, minister. I mean, so and he was very prominent then. I mean, his name will roll off your tongue. And the Kufu Atanujik, also the education minister, very popular, Professor Maria Kufi, etc. And then after that, under this government, under Akufuado, he seemed to have dropped off the, the radar bay. Um, and again, he was also a member of parliament, yeah. right? So, so he, he has a lot of experience there. But of course, he's been a board chair, you know, of the uh, Petroleum Commission, I believe. And so he's, he's been there in the background. Um, I didn't see him as somebody who would take a party position per se. So when I saw him, I, I was interested. But I think he comes to this with a formidable formidable record. Well, he does. I mean, Professor Christopher Amiakumfi, like you stated, prior to becoming education minister, was director general of the Ghana Education Service. Yeah. So when we were in secondary school, he was a DG of the GES. And so a very popular person. But does Professor Amiakumfi have, you know, um, is it that popular in the NPP to be voted as chairman of the NPP. When the race started, it looked like he was one of the persons to beat in the election. Yeah. But again, just like the uh, Alaji short case, for instance, and that he never even contested eventually, but in the case of Professor Christopher Mayakovfi, he's still contesting. He says he wants to give back to the NPP what the NPP is giving him. Unfortunately, um, I, I think that he's in the top four, but he's not in the top two for me. Okay, uh, and I, I, same will apply to Akwesie Seoje. I, I, I think he should be relaxed. I mean, say, say more yeah. politics. Former, former uh, foreign um, affairs minister? Yeah. It should be. It should I be. mean, there are people who join the race not because they want to win, but they join the race for uh, validation, to test your, you know, your popularity in the party, to establish that you have a base, but you have a long plan where you want people to recognize that you are important. Yeah. And so next time when some, they, they will come to you. So there are people, and I, and I possibly may follow him. I don't know what his reasons are, but he certainly, we don't believe, stand a chance tomorrow, um, unless there's a miracle, but he won't. But then, of course, as for Stephen Ng team, we've said a lot about him exactly. already. You know, so we won't say much about him. All we need to say in summary, based on the research we've shown you, tracking his performance for the last many, many years, is that he has the momentum on his side going in. At least the reset and the graph tells you that he's trending upwards in terms of the number of votes that he's gathered over time. And so if he continues that trend, and as we said, if he learned from those two periods we highlighted where he did something good and repeats that and that's more, he may possibly win tomorrow. He's out of the race. He's out of the race. And so you see him there, we've, you know, given but, 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 him. But I need to say this, he was not in the race. <laughs> so it's, I mean, it's good. Uh, yeah. It's good that he, he, he realized it and stepped out of, I mean, and got out of the race. Yeah. Because he was just going to... Yeah, of course. Out. I mean, Stephen Asamoah Boating, very formidable as well. Very formidable. Very. And, you know, listening to Stephen Asamoah Boating, you, 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 you get a sense of one who knows his politics. And you get a sense of a man who knows how to win elections. Even though he's been unsuccessful after the first, I mean, after he won uh, the Infantiman seat, mm -hmm. he tried it a second time, he was unsuccessful. He tried it a third time, he was unsuccessful. He wanted to be president, uh, he wanted to be flag bearer on the ticket of the NPP. Like he would say, he knew he was going to lose. He didn't even make the cut for the top five. But he's one person who knows how to engage. He's one person who knows how to communicate. And so this is the kind of person you would want to, you, I mean, you, you, you would say, he's somebody who has something to offer and is somebody who is popular in the party, but is he popular enough to be made national chairman of the NPP? 
he will do well, but will he win? It's what we can tell. What we can tell. Yeah. I say he's part of the top four. Yeah, he is. But can he win? Yeah. The delegates will decide. Uh, Kwabana Bankwa Yeboa, national treasurer. And I made the point that it's a quite a significant leap, right, from treasurer to chairman. But the mere fact that he's been there before yeah. can play to his disadvantage, but can also be a strength. Yeah. Because at least you know the ropes, you know how the party operates, you've seen the challenges, mm -hmm. but then it could be used against you. You were part of the crop that, as you illustrated, um, nearly you know, lost so much in parliament and et cetera. But he would say, but like, bottom line, we won the national, we won the president. Oh, no, the election. We won the election. <laughs> we won the election. Yeah, but... And so, yeah, I mean, so what, what, what are you asking? It, it's, it's first past the post. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a <laughs> you know, point. I, I, I see something happening. I'm just thinking about a few things. And I see that Abankwa Yeboah here, he will do well. He will do well tomorrow. I don't know who's going to win. We've said that the momentum is in the favor of uh, Stephen and team. Mm -hmm. I don't know who's going to win. Anything can happen in an election. I suspect he will do well. I don't know whether that will be enough yeah, to get him in the elections. Yeah. But because he's been in the party, and part of the problem the NPP had in around 2014, 2015, also stemmed from a few things to do with party funding. Yeah. He was at the center of it. Okay. And he stood with a flag bearer. I don't know how that would turn out tomorrow. Yeah. We're just, what's our time now? We're just oh, uh, I mean, 9.30. 930. We're just uh, you know, a few hours from tomorrow. We'll, we'll see. I mean, so my, my top two will be him. Hmm. And it's, it's, uh, it's a straight, the second, you know, in, it's between him and him. Exactly. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure, but my top two definitely, well, my, let's, my top let's, three, let's, my top let's three. Let's top three. My top three. Yes. Him, him, him. But this man could spring a surprise. He could spring a surprise. He's the, for me, he's the, he's, a, he's a dark horse in the race. He could spring a surprise, but I'll put my top, it's not if you say top four, he's in the top four. But if he takes top three, I will put him, him, him. In. And, and let me just say this, because um, I'm sure... After this coverage, we will be able to know what is happening because the delegates are being camped now and a lot will be happening from now till tomorrow. Tonight, when we, when tonight. we come back, when we come back at 8 a.m. tomorrow, tomorrow morning, we'll be able to tell you. We'll tell you a lot that will be happening. So let's look at the general secretary. He's dropped out, so I mean, he's not part of our consideration right now. John Boyd, we've said a lot about him already, I and mean, we've told you what the trend says. And, and again, he also has the win in the sale. The trend, he's been there, so we've tracked all his numbers, and his numbers are going up, and so good for him. And so he's definitely in my top two, definitely top three. Um, now, Ramseya Ahmed Ajiman Prempe is, uh, he's, he's not a known quantity, but he's a former teacher, right? And he comes to this with, you know, you, trying to say I'm a unifier. But the key question is, he's not definitely one that you say. No. Um, will make you, will make you... If, if, I mean, like we were saying earlier, people get into these elections to make a claim or make a case. And so if Ramzaya goes round and he gets a bit of support, then he means he's known within the NPP. The next time you probably would want to expect him to go to his constituency and say, I wanted to be general secretary. I was known at the, at the national level. Why don't you give me a chance? Musa Superior here. Um, yeah, I mean, he has a lot of bravado. He said a lot of controversial things. And he had said categorically as part of our series, that he, he, is, he wants to clear the field. He want, he, the, the party needs a fresh start. They don't require anybody who belongs to that old stock in the race. And you know who he's talking about. Yeah. He's talking about John Wedu, because if you bring him down, you will rise. That's what he believes. But I, 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 I doubt very much. No, 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 no. I mean, I, I, I doubt. And yes, I mean, Musa Former Supreme. Tamale. Um, parliamentary, central parliamentary candidate. He did some wonderful things in 2000. Mayor for Tamale as well. Mayor for Tamale as well. In 2011, he did a lot of wonderful things where he used social media at the time to win the, uh, you know, uh, parliamentary candidacy. But this is not his election. This, yeah, I mean, this is not his election. And then you come for me. This is a very, very formidable candidate. Yeah. I mean, Frederick Oparianza, long time Suhum member of parliament. Yeah. He's run there for so long. Uh, but he comes to this with, with a lot of um, experience. Um, he used to be under Kufo, he was a deputy communications, communications minister, minister. And he was a uh, minority chief whip yeah. when the NPP went into position from 2009 yeah. to 2013. He's a formidable candidate. And, you know, if you're looking at it, you know, if you go to the 2000... For, for me, he is going to give this man a good run for his money. He will. 
He, I mean, he will. Now, what is going to happen? And when we come to the system candidates, we're running out of time, so I'll just you know limit the. Who is the system after. candidate? Uh, it's this man. Okay. It's this man. John Boydu is your system candidate. Is the system candidate. That's what I see. I see John Boydu being the system candidate. Uh, they call him Adrian Kessie. Uh, <laughs> you heard all the whole Adrian Kessie yeah. thing before. And 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 so when you look at it critically, Frederick Operanza, if his colleague, former colleague, member uh, members of parliament, will support him, do him a favor and speak to the delegates, hmm. there's a huge chance. Okay. Will they do him that favor? He's a formidable candidate. He's one who can run the NPP. I mean, he ran uh, uh, the minority caucus so well when he was uh, my, my, uh, chief whip of the, you know, the minority group. And for those of us who are parliamentary correspondents at the time, we saw some of the things he did. Unfortunately, in this election, he's part of the top three. He will do well. Let's see what happens. We say top three. I'm not pressing my top three. It's, it's this him. man. You know why? Tell me. Um, he is the CEO of the National Youth Employment Agency. But not that reason. He used to be the Ashanti Regional Youth, youth Organizer. Youth organizer. Yeah. The reason why I'm saying that is critical. When we come to show you the delegate numbers, yeah. Ashanti Region has the biggest delegate exactly, number. Exactly, they do. Right? Mm -hmm. And for somebody who has been at the National Youth um, uh, MPP, youth organizer. Regional Youth for Ashanti Region, he, if I were him, that would be my first base. And that will, that will be my, my, my trump card. And, and that's why I think he's going to be very but let me also chip this significant in, in this let race. Let me also chip this in. I mean, you're, you're, you're very right, but there's another trump card. A lot of the constituency youth organizers are the YEA coordinators. Okay. There you have it. Okay. He's their CEO. Okay. A lot of the youth organizers, majority of them, majority of them, this is their CEO. Mm. So this man here, yeah. Has a lot. Yeah, absolutely. To offer absolutely. And comes on with a lot of support. A lot of support. And today we had this rumor about how for John Boydu, the national um, the, the the regional executives, I think the chairman. Chairman, yeah. I've I've, I've sort of said they support him also. Yeah, they've gone they've gone to yeah. show support, they've gone to throw you know, their weight behind. So him. so that again is something uh, so, that uh, we're so watching. He, you see him as a sister. Yeah, I mean so so clearly for us. Top two, him and him. Top three, he comes into the picture. So you have this, you have John Wedu, Frederico Parianza, Justin Kodria. Justin could overtake of uh, Frederico Parianza yeah. and get into the top two. Yeah, he could. He could. Um, he could. It's looking like that. A lot he of could. things would happen. Yeah. A lot of things would happen. When I come back tomorrow, yeah. when I come back to tomorrow. We'll learn a lot. We'll learn a lot tonight. A lot. I mean, and, and, and once the elections are, are done, yeah. I'll tell you a few things. Yeah, I mean, so, so that's what we think in, in terms of he definitely from the analysis has the momentum in the side, but he's going to face big challenge from these two. And so that's, that's what we think. Uh, okay, so let's look at the national organizer position. I, I, again, for me, my top two here will be him and him. I don't know what you Same, think. same. I mean, it will be uh, Daniel Nee, Kwate, Titus Global, former Deputy uh, Transport Minister, Minister. Um, and Henry Nanabwache, former National Youth Organizer um, in there. But let's look at Eric Amarko Chum. Yes, he used to be at um, GEPA, Ghana Export Promotion Authority, yeah. as deputy CEO. Uh, together with his CEO, they were removed from office. He went to the Information Ministry. He's contested to become, uh, and, and wanted to become a parliamentary candidate before. Yes, you see him as a fine gentleman. But unfortunately, in this race, yeah. in the top two, he's not part of it. Right, so Sufri Kumi, Seth Idueje. Um, they're, they're trying their life. I mean, yeah, I mean, they're also, I mean, you, you need to make the field bigger. And for whatever, whatever reason they are in, they are in. And we we'll see. But we believe, we believe this is a straight two horse race. It's a two horse race. Right? Between uh, Titus Glover and Harry Danabwache. And Titus have done a lot of media work. He has. And, and, and also, what <laughs> a lot things? of media work. I mean, no. but, but my question has always been. Are the delegates, you need to do media work or you need to do ground work? When, when, whose, whose ground game is better? When the party, is it him or him? When the party is in opposition, when the party is in opposition, if you do a lot of media work, it helps you. When the party is in power, you have to do grounds work. Yeah. You have to be there. Yeah. Not just be there, let your presence be felt. Yeah. And so, and so that will come to play tomorrow. That will come to play tomorrow. Remember, it's delegates. They are a finite number of people. And they are identified and they are in a place tonight they are going to sleep. So you, this is the first time you can see every delegate mm -hmm. in one location, mm -hmm. right? And we know where they are. We know where they are sleeping. We know. They know. Yeah. I mean, so you'll be selling to them. I bet 
they will not be sleeping tonight. No, you don't have to. <laughs> this, is, this is the night that can make or make you. In, 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 in fact, Evan, let me just chip this. In. If, if, these, if this election you know, were held outside Accra, yeah. you and I wouldn't be sleeping. Yeah. We would be there with of the course. delegates of trying course. to pick information. Of course. And after here, we'll be there also. Oh, yeah, we'll pick some we'll information. Pick some information. Tell you what's up. So you want to join us tomorrow at 8, because we are going to back tomorrow at 8, and we'll tell you what we picked up from tonight's wheeling and dealing. Let's go on. Um, this is the national youth organizer position. I, I must say, I mean, I'm not inspired by any of them. Because, and, and I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but I, I'm generally not inspired. Because most often they're not for the parties. When they were go, when, before elections, there's one or two candidates who just grab your attention. Yeah. None of them have done so this time around. Uh, yeah, yes, I, I, yeah. I have seen... I've, I've seen, seen Abanga. Abanga. I've seen yeah. Salam, yeah. Uh, Mustafa. And like you stated, you know, the last election's youth organizer position was keenly contested. Yeah, it was keenly contested. I don't feel that kind of... Uh, yeah, the vibe, it's, vibe this isn't, time around. Isn't there. Um, so it looks like between this yeah. two, Abanga and uh, Salam, Salam Mohammed. Two, maybe this one could join... Uh, let's see how it goes. Yeah, I mean, I asked for, for this for the very first time. It, it's, it's it's not one of the positions. No, where it's not. It, it hasn't got bars much. around. Bars, it. no, there's no bars you know, around it. But so so that's what we have. Of course, the national women's organizer. He is, she is, she is, she has the win in her sale. She's been there. She's still the incumbent. But Helen Ama Dako and Hajia Suida to side. Do you know her? Tell me. She's the deputy national women organizer. So that is going to be key because she's going to come up against her boss. Do you know when this happened? The last time it happened, Tell me. it happened in 2014. And what happened? Where Tina Mensa, who was Deputy National Women Organizer to Utikwa Fisa Jaba, tried on seating her and she lost. Okay. You're not saying that that is going to be her fate? No. Okay. I mean, when, when, if it happened, I would, I would refer you to this. Okay, well, we'll remember that. We'll remember. So that's the race for, for the women's organizer uh, who, you know, deputy coming up against her boss. Yeah. And there's a dark horse there, by yes, the way. Yes, there's a dark horse, dark horse Elena, Elena Madako. Madako. She's okay. been in a lot of work in the media. She's been representing the party in a lot of media platforms. Yeah. Is that enough to give her the votes? I do not know. Yeah. Um, tomorrow, again, when I come, when we come back tomorrow, we'll be able we'll, to tell. We'll tell you. Now, this is the story I was telling you why I believe the um, uh, Justin Kodia, Justin Kodia yeah. may have an advantage, considering that he's been the uh, national, the Ashanti, Ashanti Regional, Regional Youth, Youth Organizer. Organizer. Because if you look at the... At the at the table here, it tells you the delegate numbers for each region. And the significant disparity between Ashanti region and, and the rest of the regions, Winston. Yes, because look, 816. 816. That's huge. That's huge. Look, the, the closest is, is greater, is, is greater, greater Accra, Accra. 595. So there you have it. Yeah. The Ashanti region is key in it's all key. of this. Yeah. And I have told you of, I mean, I told you of how he's, uh, you know, CEO of a youth employment agency. A lot of the youth organizers find themselves in the youth employment agency as, uh, you know, uh, district coordinators. And so that in itself gives him a lot of advantage going into mm -hmm. this election. And um, if you were to speak to Charles B.C. today, he would tell you that um, a lot of the people, uh, and I mean, there was this attempt to garner the support of all of them at a go. And so they all were in support of him or exhibit support for him and campaign for him. But the numbers in the Ashanti region is also significant and actually gives him a lot of votes yeah. going into this. So for, as far as strategy goes tonight, a lot of the candidates will be, you have to definitely go to You have to, to be here. I mean, you find where the Ashanti region guys are staying. Yeah, now you go there. And go there. Yeah. Right, you have to go there because for, for the very first time, all of them will be in one place. So you go there. Um, you also need to come to Greater Accra, look for the weather, Greater Accra. Yeah. I, by the way, I hope that the Greater Accra, because they are in Greater Accra, they, they also put them up. Oh, no, or they no, no, no. allow them to sleep in their own no, home. I mean, no, but that would be very difficult. Because no, you can, no, you will find a place. And okay, good. Because they want to transport all of them to the, to the place. Towns. Okay. They want to be done in no time. Yeah. So that's what is going to so happen. So you want to you know, go to attack Greater Accra, go to Eastern, Eastern Region as well. Central. And go to Central as well. Um, yeah, you mean, of Come course. Come to Western. Come to Western. Northern. So, so those who play a role. But I find it very interesting. Ministers, deputies, of course, if you go to... Um, Parliament, the MPs, MMDCs, significant number as well. Yeah. That you also try and, and that is where you make the point about Federico Parianza. Exactly. If Federico Parianza can play that card well, he's going to get a, a significant number of the MPs, possibly, 
joint. I mean, seeing him as one of their own in the past, etc. Talking to the was a deputy whip, etc. So they, they can, that can prove significant for him. There's also this one, Tescon. The Tescon, Tescon. 290. And Tescon, young people, yeah. they may identify with... The youth, Kodia. Kodia, again. So like, and it was just like so, you. What do you do? So that, but in all, in all tomorrow, 6,146, we'll we're good. making the decision and we're going to be bringing the carrot until we know the results uh, of, that, of that particular uh, elections. But here again, now, you know, lost main elections. Um, so this is the previous elections as far as the um, you know, the national elections concerned? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, for instance, if we're looking at, um, you know, um, in 1992, uh, when B.J. Darocha was chairman of the NPP, they lost. In 1996, uh, when um, Peter Lajete, he was chairman. In 1995, he won the chairman. Uh, you know, they lost with Ajani Mboating as uh, the secretary. In 2000, the NPP won with um, uh, Samuel Ode Sykes, with Dan Boche as the secretary. Then in 2004, Harun Eseku with Dan Boche as the secretary. That election was held in 2001. They also won. In 2008, uh, we know what happened mm -hmm. because then you had Peter Mark Menu and Ohin in tow. Uh, they lost. In 2012, you know of, uh, you know, Kojo Owusu Efriye and um, Jacob Eche Bilamte, 2010 elections uh, conference, they also lost. In 2014, the chairman and secretary who won the election were both suspended. And so you had First Vice Chairman, Acting Chairman, Freddie Blay, going into that particular elections with um, uh, John Buedu, and they won. In 2020, the same team uh, came in, Freddie Blay, John Buedu, they won. We're yet to see what would happen in 2024. Now, let's wrap up now and tell you, whoever wins tomorrow, this is the picture that he will be hoping to do better with, right? This is the research that he has to look. Whoever wins tomorrow as chairman, General Secretary, whatever, they are going to come up against this because we're going to pull up for you. This is, a, this is the attempt to break the eight. The, the bottom line is, whoever wins tomorrow, this is the real reason why they are contesting. And this is what their focus should be. And so we're going to give you a, a taste of what the trend has been and the challenge that whoever wins is going to face. So if you go back, I mean, the trend shows us, Winston, that from... You're as good as your last performance in your exactly. last elections, exactly. right? So if you take that, and this is the mark here, you, you see that the like NPP is on the downward trajectory as a party. Yes, they are. So whoever wins is going to have a tough time trying to send this back up and, and attempt to so break the eight. Let me just do this. Now that you've talked about it. Yeah. Runoff, 56. Mm -hmm. Here, yeah, let's start over the runoff. Yeah, this is 50. the 2000 56. runoff. Come to 52. So this is the runoff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Then come to the 2004 elections, 52. From 56 to 50. So there's a drop. There's a drop. Then come to 2008. There's a drop, not enough to get them into office. Yeah. And by the runoff. In 2008. And eight, they still do not make Almost, it mm, very close very and they lose that election. Yeah. In 2012, they still lost that election, mm -hmm. but they're still dropping. Yeah. Then they go up to 53.9% in 2016. Uh, you know, uh, 2016? 16. 16. If, yeah. yes, if the trend you see here is anything to go by, if the trend you see here is anything to go by, you probably would be saying the NPP may go down. But at what percentage is where the real issue is? Mm -hmm. Because if we begin to look at this percentage, what we are seeing, we would say, would the NPP go down so much to warrant a loss in the election? Or they will go down in a way where they can break the eight? Yeah. I cannot say that for now. The events leading to the elections will determine. And the people they elect yeah. have a major role. And, and listen, delegates who are watching us tonight, this is what your eyes should be on. You should appreciate what is here. The task that whoever you're going to elect is going to face is, is significant. First of all, nobody has broken the aid before. Yeah. Right? But again, your dip, as I said earlier, is, is not, it's, it's, it's quite a, a dip that in, in numerical terms, even in percentage terms, it's not too big, right? No, it's not too big. It's not too big. No, it's, I mean, right? In percentage terms, it's not too big. Also because we, had, we increased the numbers. Exactly. So the numbers increase. Exactly. And so you can actually make the case also Statistically, you can actually make the case and say, maybe there were new voters yeah. who were unhappy with us. Yeah. Or maybe the new voters were the ones who gave us. Yeah. In Ghana, we don't do a lot of exit polls to be able to determine yeah. the new voters and how they voted. 
If we're doing that, we probably would have been able to check and say, this is what really happened. Okay, so we did a line graph. Um, and again, if you're a delegate, this one should tell you what the reality is. But if you do the trend, right, and you plot your line through, it tells you that the MPP is on an upward trajectory. Yeah. Right? The linear tells you you're on an upward trajectory. So, and again, so that's the dotted line here, if you run it through it. It's an upward trajectory. So do you say, do you look at this and say, well, the task is not as, as, as dire as people are making it? It still is. It still is. I mean, still is. What, 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 Don't get deceived. It still what, is. While you look at this, so, I mean, if I, I mean, if, if I put the numbers in here, you probably may say, oh, we're doing well. Yeah. But you see, what you see, and look at it this way, you know, because it's cut in here. But at the point in time, you can see if it had moved on, if it had moved on, even this line would have gone up. If this number had increased, this line would have gone up. Yeah. So it gives you that signal. And I am saying, if you are the NPP going to vote tomorrow, ask yourself the critical question. Who amongst all the candidates mm -hmm. can help you break the eight? Yeah. Would you opt for continuity mm -hmm. or you would opt for a change? Mm -hmm. That's the decision you have to make. That's a decision. And remember that this is what you are up against, what we're yeah. showing you. Who amongst the candidates that we've just gone through can make this begin to tick up? Exactly. Again, who can do so? Because but the evidence shows that it's, it always goes down. Down. And nobody spot. has done it. But Winston, um, for me, mm -hmm. We cannot do this analysis and take out the IMF factor. Very important. Because we are an IMF. So what we did today is to go back and look at the IMF numbers again in the years we went and see if we can begin to draw certain conclusions mm -hmm. about what the IMF programs we've been in the Fourth Republic, what they say about election outcomes. And I must tell you, if you're a delegate or if you're an MPP, that the conclusions that we came to, very grim for you. In addition to the fact that you're attempting to break the eight, these are the two conclusions which thing that we came to. First of all, in the Fourth Republic, each time a party in power had gone to the IMF in their second term, they've always lost the elections. Yeah. In the Fourth Republic. Each time a party had gone, to, had gone to the IMF in their second term, they've always lost elections. And the conclusion we came to, each time a party had gone to the IMF in their first term, they won. They continued to, as, as a party in power. They didn't lose elections. They could, let's illustrate it. Don't take my word for it. This is it, mm -hmm. Winston. So this is the IMF programs we've been on since 1992, the yeah. beginning of the Fourth Republic. So the first time I went to the IMF is... 95. 95. This was Rawlings' first time, right? Mm -hmm. Before the 1996 elections. elections. The NDC won. They won the elections. Yeah. So they wanted the, the, the Rawlings' regime, the first four years, he went to the IMF, but he did so before his second term. Exactly. He did so in his first term. He won the elections. And in fact, if you check the results, he had a slight dip, but it was marginal. It was a 1%. Yeah, I mean, very, very marginal. But bottom line is, he won the election because we believe he went in the first term. Now, come to Rawlings' second term. He went to the IMF again. What was the outcome? He lost the elections, as in the NDC lost the election. The NDC lost the election. This time, Rawlings wasn't contesting. R Rawlings wasn't contesting. The NDC, the NDC lost the, lost the election. So yeah. NDC lost when they went in the second term. Now, come to Kufo. He went to the IMF. But he did so in his first term. In, in his first term. What happened in the next election? He won. He won the elections. Now, in the next term, he didn't go, there was no IMF program. Yeah. So that, we, we take it out because that he broke the mold. He broke the, the, the trend. Yeah. He didn't go. But the next government, the NDC government, in, 29, in 2009, go to the IMF and they win the 2012 elections. Because? Well, that was it was the in the first term. term. Then they go back to the IMF in 2015, in their second term, and they lose the elections. elections. What, has the, what has the MPP done this time? They have done so 
in 2022, all things being equal, we'll get a program. In 2023. In 2023. That will be in your second term. Yeah. And look at something. This is... Second term, lost. 1999. Lost. A year before the elections. Lost. This is 2015, a year before the elections. Yeah, let's go back. 2015, a year before the election. We're likely to get a program in 2023, a year before the elections. That sends you a signal. That tells you a lot. Um, and some of these things... <laughs> I know you, you're saying it, but, but it's fact. It's fact that 999 second year, second term, NDC loses. 19, 2015, they go, they lose. If you are using that as an indicator, the prospects are very grim for you in addition to attempting to do something that nobody has done before, as in Break the Eight. If you're just using the IMF program as an indicator, in our fourth republic, if you're an MPP, you should be very worried. Sure. Because he says, if you did it in your second term, everybody who also has done it in your second term before you, they lost, the they lost the elections. If you had done it in your first term, and there are many who have said, Winston, you have followed this, that we, we and I had you doing the um, analysis with the professor who had done the, um, uh, the, the machine the learning. Machine learning, yeah. And he said that, as of 2019, we're due for the IMF. We're due for the IMF. The point is, if, we had, if the MPP had done it in 19, 2019, 2019, and 2020, according to the history, the history, they would have sailed through. They would have sailed through. So then this time around, we'll, they probably will not go back. We'll not go back to the IMF. Because particularly in 2020, we could have used that as an opportunity to go back to the IMF. Because COVID was really disturbing. But this is, like our people say, this is what it is. This is what it is. This is what it is. What happens tomorrow. Yeah. So that's the picture. And why are we ending here? We want the delegates to appreciate what they are up against. What you're up against is what we've just told you. Whoever you elect to lead you as a chairman, general secretary, organizer, youth organizer, whatever you elect, they're coming up against two huge, um, how do you call it? Um, Heddles. Heddles. That and nobody has surmounted before. Breaking the eight. And the IMF as an indicator of election outcomes. So, well, I guess the ball is in their court. In their court. And tomorrow at 8, we are back on air, Wednesday, myself, and the team um, will, will join all of you at 8 here on your election headquarters with the most comprehensive coverage. We're bringing back some of this, but we'll be telling you what is happening tonight. The wheeling and dealing. We're actually supposed to cross over to the UPSA, but um, well, well, we'll go and sniff out and bring you the, the juice tomorrow. So you want to stay with us tomorrow from 8 a.m. till the final results are known. We're going to be with you. We are going to start at 8 myself. Something is going to take over with um, news file, but we'll be crossing over to the grounds as and when we have big things happening from 12, we take over again and we go all the way. We're going to have uh, Dr. Asa Sante join us. Dr. Ali Bisedu will join us as well. And I'm looking forward to also seeing Dr. Makoba. Richard Makoba. Dr. Richard Makoba, because he himself had contested in the chairmanship store before. Exactly. And he's also a political scientist. He used to exactly. be the head of the KNUSC Science political KNUSC. science department. He's going to be our guest also tomorrow. So we have the very best for you tomorrow. Please join us and let's find out together who the delegates elect to attempt to do the miraculous in 2024. My name is Evans Mensah. My name is Winston Amor. Thank you.